Pierre du Fermat was a 17th century French lawyer and mathematician famous for his work in number theory. Math was largely treated as a hobby by him, which makes it even more amazing how much influence he had on developments in mathematics. Some of his notable contributions include being a key influencer in the development of infinitesimal calculus, being one of the founders of probability theory, Fermat's principle, and Fermat's last theorem, which states that no three positive integers a, b, and c satisfy the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n for any integer value of n greater than 2. Fermat was born in Poumont du Lomagne in Occitanie, France. His birth date isn't known precisely, but it's believed he was born in 1607, between October 31st and December 6th. His parents were Dominique Fermat, a wealthy leather merchant who served three one-year terms as the second consul of four of Poumont du Lomagne, and Claire Dulon, who came from an aristocratic family. Sadly, she died when Fermat was seven years old. Fermat was one of four children, having a brother and two sisters, and the entire family lived in a 15th century mansion. Almost nothing is known about Fermat's early education, other than that he probably attended Collège du Navarre in Montauban, as well as briefly attending the University of Toulouse. During the 1620s, Fermat studied law and eventually received his bachelor's in civil law from the University of Orléans. He spent a few years in Bordeaux before this, where his interest in mathematics was born. In Bordeaux, he befriended Etienne d'Espagne, a 17th century parliamentary counselor who had an interest in mathematics. D'Espagne had inherited quite a few important books, some of which were mathematical and included work from Archimedes, an ancient Greek polymath regarded as the greatest mathematician of ancient history, and François Viet, a 17th century French mathematician notable for his influence on modern elementary algebra by using letters as parameters in equations. Fermat studied Viet closely, adopting his style, and he studied Archimedes' work on geometry. Eventually, his studies of geometry led him to Kepler's work on finding the optimal volume of wine casks, leading Fermat to construct a work on finding extreme and tangent lines for curves, later titled Method for Determining Maxima and Minima and Tangents to Curved Lines. In the work, he introduces the method of adequality, giving credit to Diophantus, and uses this in an algorithm that essentially yields differentiation at a point. He also restored the work Plane Loci by Apollonius of Perga, an ancient Greek geometer and astronomer notable for his work on conic sections. In 1628, Fermat's father died, leaving him a huge inheritance. From this grand sum, he was able to pay a huge amount to get a senior legal position in the High Court of Toulouse in 1631. Apparently, the equivalent of a million dollars today. Receiving this position, he was now able to add du into his name because of his status. And he now had a job for life, steadily climbing the ranks with a promotion to the High Chamber in Parliament in 1638, and another promotion to the highest level of the criminal court in 1652. Shortly after getting into the High Court, Fermat married his fourth maternal cousin, Louis Dulong, on June 1st, 1631. They had eight children together, but only five survived into adulthood. Though his occupation was as a lawyer, Fermat's keen interest and talents in mathematics naturally led to correspondence with other mathematicians, such as Pierre du Carcovy, a mathematician who was also a counselor in Toulouse with him. The pair bonded over mathematics, and Carcovy eventually made his way to Paris in 1636 to be a royal librarian. Carcovy ended up befriending Mersenne, Mersen, a 16th century French polymath notable for his conception of Mersenne primes. Carcovy told Mersenne about Fermat, leading Mersenne to write him. Fermat responded at the end of April 1636, and some of what was discussed included Errors he felt that Galileo made in describing freefall, and work he'd done on spirals, including approximating the area under a spiral, which was influenced by studying Galileo and Archimedes. He also sent problems on extrema, asking Mersenne to pass the problems on to Parisian mathematicians. Fermat also sent these problems to Gilles de Robertval, a 17th century French mathematician who had been working independently on finding tangent lines. He found the problems to be extremely difficult and asked Fermat to send him the methods that would help solve such problems. 
This led Fermat to send him method for determining maxima and minima and tangents to curved lines, which was then circulated around. He was also sent an algebraic approach to geometry titled Introduction to Plane and Solid Loci, showing how an equation from algebra could be also described as a geometric curve. So Fermat invented analytic geometry independent of René Descartes a 17th century French philosopher and mathematician, notable for his contributions to foundational geometry. With these correspondences, Fermat quickly became one of the leading mathematicians in the world during the 1630s. However, any attempts to get published failed, largely because he didn't care enough to clean up his work to be published. Some of his methods did end up being published, but through other people's works. For instance, Pierre Hergigon, a 17th century French mathematician and astronomer who taught in Paris, published a work titled Cursus Mathematicus, which contained Fermat's methods on finding extrema. Robert Val also offered to edit and publish for him, but Fermat didn't want his name on anything, apparently wanting to avoid controversy. While some mathematicians enjoyed the problems Fermat sent, others reacted poorly. Nicole Dubessy, a 17th century French mathematician notable for writing many papers in number theory and combinatorics, started feeling teased by Fermat's problems. He felt they were impossible and wrote angry letters. Fermat also ran into problems with Descartes. While in Bordeaux, Fermat had befriended a mathematician named Jean Bougron, a 17th century French mathematician who published works on geostatics and coined the term cycloid. The two kept up correspondence well after Fermat left Bordeaux at some point sending Fermat Le Duoptrique, an essay by Descartes that used various models to try and understand properties of light, introducing the law of refraction. Fermat was busy with other exchanges and basically ignored the work until Mersenne asked him his opinion on it, to which Fermat described it as groping about in the shadows and saying that the law of refraction had not been properly deduced. This comment got back to Descartes, and needless to say, it didn't please him in the slightest. Descartes also felt that Fermat's work on Extrema undermined La Géométrie, published by Descartes in 1637, a year after Fermat's work began circulating. This ultimately led Descartes to attack Fermat's work. To Fermat, Descartes gave high praise to work he'd done on determining tangents to a cycloid, but then Descartes said quite the opposite in a letter to Mersenne, going as far as saying Fermat was a mediocre mathematician. Descartes was a big name in the mathematical game, whereas Fermat was essentially just some lawyer. So the clout that Descartes had really enabled this ruining venture he was embarking on. Between 1643 and 1654, Fermat lost touch with many of the people he was corresponding with. The conjecture for why this was lies in a few possible reasons. The damage Descartes had done. Too much law work taking his focus away from mathematics. A civil war that broke out in 1648 in France, which greatly affected Toulouse. And the plague outbreak beginning in 1651, which had a very negative effect on life in Toulouse. Fermat himself ended up getting the plague, but luckily survived. This didn't stop a false reporting of his death, though, which was quickly resolved. Recalling that he'd gotten a promotion to the highest court in 1652, it's suspected he got this promotion purely because a lot of the older men in government had died from the plague, thus leaving vacant positions. Despite the lack of correspondence, Fermat continued working on number theory during this time. In 1654, Fermat began a correspondence with Blaise Pascal, a 17th century French polymath notable for being one of the inventors of the mechanical calculator and Pascal's triangle. Pascal had been asked to solve a gambling problem in dividing stakes and enlisted Fermat's help. The problem concerned a dice game described as follows. If a player has bet, he can throw a six with eight throws of a single die, but the turn is halted after three unsuccessful throws. What is the fairest way to share the stake money out? Fermat solved the problem by looking at the probabilities of all possible outcomes. This exchange between Pascal and Fermat is considered the birth of probability theory. With his prime interest being in number theory, Fermat was starting to feel people's lack of interest in his challenges, and tried getting Pascal into number theory with the hopes of even getting his work published. Considering Fermat's work was always a bit rough, with Fermat not willing to clean it up, and Pascal definitely not willing to make any edits, the correspondence started to wither. This didn't stop Fermat from trying to send more problems out to others, though. 
claiming two of his problems were unsolvable by all of Europe. One of these problems, now known as the pell fermat equation, was to find all integer solutions to the equation nx squared plus 1 equal to y squared, where n is a positive non-square integer. The problem wasn't solved until quite a few years later, solved by William Bronker, a 17th century Irish mathematician who founded the Royal Society of London, and John Wallace, a 17th century English mathematician notable for discovering methods to evaluate integrals as well as coining the symbol for infinity. The solution used continued fractions and formally kicked off continued fractions as a mathematical field. In 1656, Fermat began a correspondence with Christian Huygens, a 17th century Dutch mathematician and scientist, notable for inventing the pendulum clock, and is considered the founder of modern mathematical physics. Huygens initially reached out to Fermat wanting to discuss probability, but Fermat quickly pivoted the conversation towards number theory. Though Huygens wasn't very interested, Fermat ended up sending a work revealing a large amount of his methods, more so than he had done in other correspondences. The work was titled New Account of Discoveries and the Science of Numbers. He sent this work in 1659, also sending to his old friend Kochkevi. In the work, he introduced the method of infinite descent, giving an example, proving it by contradiction, of how one could prove the following conjecture. Every prime number of the form 4k plus 1 could be written as the sum of two squares. Alas, in his proof, Fermat failed to explain a step, leading mathematicians to believe that he didn't know how to actually prove it properly. Thus, any interest was lost. In 1657, one of Descartes' students contacted Fermat as they were trying to collect Descartes' correspondences for publication. Looking through his old letters, Fermat stumbled upon his judgments on the law of refraction that he'd made about 20 years earlier. Though Fermat wasn't very interested in physical applications, he decided to revisit the problem, now deducing the law himself with an assumption he felt was proper. Nature always acts by the shortest course meaning that light passes between two points in the least possible time, which is not the same as saying light takes the shortest path between the points, as light changes direction when it refracts. This was coined the principle of least time, and this principle directly influenced the conception of the principle of least action, a variational principle that can be used to obtain the equations of motion for a given system. This same year, 1659, Fermat wrote a work later titled treatise on quadrature, where he studied area under the curve and derived the general power rule for integration while studying y equals x to the n over m. Fermat sliced the area under the curve into smaller and smaller rectangles as x became close to zero, using powers of some value r, where r was strictly between zero and one. He then summed the areas up to yield an infinite series. Using geometric series and substitution, he yielded the general formula. The notion of a limit was hinted at in the work, but of course wasn't formally defined yet. With this work and his earlier work on extrema and tangents, Sir Isaac Newton ended up being greatly influenced by Fermat in his development of infinitesimal calculus in the late 1600s. On January 12, 1665, Fermat passed away in Castres, France, and was buried in the church of Saint Dominique in Castres. The cause of death is unknown, and just a few days before his death, he was carrying out legal business in a local courthouse. For the few years leading up to his death, Fermat continued to work on number theory as he found time. And posthumously, many notes were found by Fermat's son, including in his copy of Diophantus' Arithmetica. Scribbled into the margin of the book was the conjecture that for any integer n greater than 2, the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n has no positive integer solutions. Fermat wrote further that he had a proof, but the margin was far too small for him to write it in. Apparently, Fermat had written this in 1637, but didn't seem to discuss with anyone. So, even though this was not his last theorem, it became known as Fermat's last theorem. The conjecture is simple to understand, and many great mathematicians unsuccessfully tried to solve it, including Leonard Euler, an 18th century Swiss mathematician considered to be the most prolific mathematician to ever exist, Peter Dirichli, a 19th century German mathematician notable for his contributions to mathematical analysis and creating analytic number theory, and Carl Friedrich Gauss, a primarily 19th century German mathematician whose contributions to mathematics gained him the title the greatest mathematician since antiquity. Alas, it wasn't until the end of 1994 that the first actual proof was yielded, 
provided by Sir Andrew Wiles, an English mathematician at the University of Oxford who specializes in number theory. With over 300 years of unsuccessful attempts, the attempts at solving the problem, even if unsuccessful, proved to be quite fruitful, as there were many mathematical developments and theories that arose from the ventures, including the development of commutative ring theory. Considering the mathematics Wiles had to use to prove the conjecture, many mathematicians believe that it is very unlikely that Fermat's proof could have been correct, even if he indeed had one. Fermat was described as secretive and reserved, which definitely didn't help him with getting his work truly out there. The notation he used, that of Viet, was outdated as well. It didn't matter much in number theory, as not many people were as interested as Fermat was, but his notation probably didn't entice non-number theorists to read his work. Despite this, his impact on mathematics has been tremendous, and it's all the more remarkable what he was able to accomplish with mathematics being mostly a hobby for him. If you enjoyed the video, please click that like button and subscribe. And if you generally just enjoy the content of this channel, please consider supporting on Patreon. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.